Welcome to Rising Woman Leaders. I'm your host, Meredith Rahm, and I believe the time has come for women to share their gifts, their voice, and their stories. I love seeing women spiritually and financially empowered, thriving in their life's work, and doing what they love every day. I've gathered a community of women living their dreams to tell us their stories and inspire us to step into more courage, self-love, and feminine leadership. If you like this podcast, follow me on Instagram at Rising Woman Leaders and sign up for email updates at risingwomanleaders.com. Now get cozy with a journal and a cup of tea. I hope you enjoy today's show. I'm here today with Karen Prozen, who is a woman's witness, a daughter of devotion, and an artist. She guides rising femme leaders into self-initiation and remembrance with her many offerings, in person and online. Trained as a clinical mental health therapist with emphasis on social justice, somatics, mindfulness, and trauma healing, she serves as a student first and foremost. Karen supports women to treat their bodies as temples, become living vessels, and pour their magic forth on the pilgrimage of leadership, love, and liberation. She believes that life is a gift, and even so, no one should ever have to do it alone. Thank you for being here, Karen. Thank you so much for having me, Meredith. I'm honored to be here with you and your beautiful community. Thank you. So you were one of the early guests on the podcast. (laughs) You've watched the whole journey of this podcast growing and expanding and reaching more people. Um, So yeah, within the first 10 episodes, I think you were here to talk about your life. And that must have been three years ago or more. (laughs) And a lot has happened and shifted and changed. And um, Karen is one of my best friends, so we'll probably giggle a lot in this conversation. Um, And yeah, I would love to hear about the journey you've been on, particularly starting from when you left Sonoma County. Um, You've been traveling and living in other places and following the callings of your heart. Um, So I wonder if we could just go back in time to where you were in your life, the job you had, the relationship you had, the home you had, um, how things were going for you living here in Sonoma County right before you left and why you decided to leave. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, it has been a journey and I think that the theme of that time and what led me to leave was fire. So with the fires that happened in Sonoma County, that was a big catalyst. I had finished graduate school and I was working at a wonderful somatics and mindfulness therapy community clinic and working with people suffering from psychotic disorders was working with them in individual therapy and I had a relationship and lived in a beautiful yurt a beautiful piece of land and something arising within me was causing me to just seek deeper deeper love and deeper meaning and I was getting really attracted to a spiritual community that worshipped Kali along with Durga and uh, other forms of the goddess and found myself chanting a lot to Kali, singing a lot to Kali and really living a repetitive prayer to be dissolved by her uh, and doing it with joy and so much excitement. (laughs) And yeah, it wasn't long after that that uh, my job, my relationship, my home, uh, everything just was taken away really within a weekend. And it was the same weekend that the fire started. Mm. And the reason I had to leave my job and the reason 
my relationship ended among many reasons was because I was going through a really powerful transformative process mm-hmm. with a, what I would call Kundalini, which I'm happy to share more about, even though I'm not a scholar, I just kind of have been on a personal journey with it. And yeah, that led me to Bali where a lot more transformation happened. And yeah, it's been over a year of navigating that journey and that transformation. And I think I'm finally in a place where it's starting to settle in my body and I'm able to integrate some of the wisdom and the, and the, the gems that I've discovered through the, the uproar of energy in my body and even the terror that I first experienced uh, in the first couple months. And yeah, it's really not a joke when you're working with Kali. It's really, (laughs) uh, she'll take you on a, on a big journey, a big ride, um, through yourself. Um, yeah. And I think a lot of people are scared of Kali and I definitely was, and I was like, be careful. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, but witnessing you through that experience actually really showed me that what was burning away was for your highest and best good. And I watched that journey and was like, wow, even though this is hard, this is also filled with love and this is bringing you into a better place. Mm. And I saw that as you went to Bali and just kind of released the things that were no longer serving you. Like Kali is about that destruction, yet she's there to really cut away the things that you don't need anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a good, um, yeah, just a reflection to have for anyone thinking about Kali and how they can welcome her into life because it takes a lot of bravery, but it's also will really up-level your life. (laughs) (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I think the the a word that really resonates with me with Kali is is liberation. And I think it's Adyashanti who said, You if you want liberation, you have to want it more than you want comfort mm-hmm. and more than you want a an illusion of safety. Yeah. Or an illusion of something that's right and good and good for you. It's really an opportunity to release some of that and what I've found on the journey of I guess a fiery path of devotion is that when things are taken away from me what I'm gifted with in return is always better and always beyond what I expected anything that I could have dreamed of so if I look at my life now it's infinitely better and I never could have imagined it like I couldn't have planted a seed of intention of like how beautiful the things are happening the things are happening for me right now yeah. and that's something that yeah I think on my path I've discovered that the path of devotion and transformation you you have to understand that you might not get the fruits of your labor like you have to go into it without knowing that you're going to be rewarded Mm -hmm. without knowing that you're going to receive so much Um, and I think that's where I guess that humility or that surrender is what really allows the the fruits and flowers and the joy and pleasure to to arise yeah Mm -hmm. and that's scary scary. (laughs) jumping (laughs) off a cliff Mm -hmm. Um, so tell us what is kundalini awakening Mm. So Kundalini is the creative life force that is stored at the base of the spine. And this comes from the yogic traditions in India, but you can see it in some other traditions as well, different artwork and, and things like that. And not everybody experiences is, is going to experience Kundalini, but we all have the seed of creation. We're walking around with it. And the truth is that it's actually like an atomic bomb of energy that we all have the infinite power um, within us. And we're not often taught that, so people don't really know about it. And when people start to have Kundalini awakening, they might not know what it is and they might be 
really scared and they might end up in hospitals. And so it's a personal mission of mine to share my story and help normalize some of the processes and experiences that people had, that people can have in a wide range. And so the idea is that at the base of the spine, there's this primordial energy that is represented by a a snake that's coiled three and a half times. And when that energy rises, it's essentially Shakti. And when it meets with Shiva in the center of the mind, you experience full awakening. And we can say that all the masters that have accomplished this uh, have fully awakened their kundalini energy. And we're all on a journey to open to this power that can manifest as terrifying, but can also manifest as pure pleasure and pure joy, and and pure bliss and ecstasy. Mm -hmm. And tell us, what was your experience? Like, what were some of the physical sensations or Mm -hmm. symptoms or things that you were experiencing? Yeah, so it's a wide range, and there's probably hundreds of symptoms that people can experience. But for me, it began with hot liquid, flowing up my spine and it would then spread throughout my whole body and it would often be followed by a lot of shaking and sometimes crying and it would be connected to visuals as well I would have really intense visuals that were really difficult for me to uh, be okay with and to talk about and to admit that were happening to me So terrifying thoughts, terrifying images, really, really hard nighttime experiences, dreams and things like that. And yeah, there were times when I would black out a bit. There were times when I would just stand up and the whole world would flip upside down. Um, Those are just a couple off the top of my head, but pain in the chest, Mm -hmm. a lot of shaking. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. Is there something about like the body not being fully prepared for it yet and that why it being difficult cuz I wonder about the people who are in, become enlightened like if actually it's more of just a blissful experience because they're ready for it. Mm, such a great question. So I actually read that the Buddha when he experienced enlightenment it that it was the most excruciating pain he ever experienced. Wow. Yeah, so I'm not sure that it's comfortable for anybody um, on the journey. I have experienced a lot of bliss after I went through several months of surrender to physical pain, emotional, psychological challenge. It slowly softened into more pleasure experiences. And... There is a really important part of preparation that I wish I knew about. And I've been practicing yoga since I was 16 and taking as best care of my body as I can and living a very sober, sattvic lifestyle. And still, I I was not prepared for this level of circuitry to be moving through my body. And it's interesting because in the last podcast... I did with you, I was teaching about the body as a vessel and how important it is to prepare our body for what I call quote unquote God moments. You never know when it's when you're next, you know, when grace is going to move through you in its many forms and we have to be ready. We have to surrender and listen to what our body is wanting because it knows what we're capable of. It knows how much power and love is wanting to be opened inside of us and there's a commitment there to to being that vessel and to being available for shakti for christ to awaken into and it's amazing how i knew those teachings because i was teaching them and they came through me through healing my eating disorder that yeah there was still no way i could have been prepared for this even though i had a kundalini like awakening when i was 19 it was months of electrical experiences at night and that was nothing compared to what I went through in the past year so I can't stress enough 
how important it is to take care of our bodies, to take care of the the nervous system, the subtle energies, to receive these charges because along with the charge comes eventually the integration of the wisdom and the embodiment that wants to be shared with a world that is changing so quickly and needing these teachings to be activated in us and embodied in a good way. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you could speak to about preparing your body for something like this? Like if you if you were to shift anything and go back or uh, great question well I struggled because I had a tailbone and a hip injury that made it so I really couldn't do a lot of exercise and movement over about a year and a half so I think that that was a big part of why it was so difficult for me to host that much energy mm. I did find relief and integration through supplementation and diet, sleeping really well, and definitely sobriety. I think that the reading that I've done is that when people start to have kundalini experiences, they'll intuitively feel like they need to eat more grounding food or they need to fast, and it's so different, like everybody kind of knows what they need to do, so it's hard to say. Uh, I think just loving the body, listening to the body, practicing yoga, practicing breath work, I think would all be really helpful as well as staying grounded. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I had a question. I have to think of it. <laughs> what, do you have any thoughts on why it happens to some people and not others? That's such a good question. <laughs> Uh, I do think that there is like a karmic and dharmic component. So I remember my Vedic astrologer telling me months before it started happening, hey, just wanted to let you know you're going to have some really big kundalini experiences coming up uh, and you might want to get support and you might want to like just take care of your vata energy. Um, and I totally forgot about it and just let it go but then when it started happening I looked back at my notes and I was like wow to the day so I, I think that there's an astrological component um, and aside from that I, I do believe that it's just ordained that we're it's it's faded and if you have a longing to awaken that's the beginning of awakening so wow. anybody out there that says like, yeah, I want to know the truth. I want to be united with my truth and the truth of my name and the truth of my soul. It'll start happening. Like wow. I, I pray that every night, you know, before I go to bed and every morning when I wake up, because there's nothing that's more important to me. There's nothing. <laughs> wow. So... I have a tendency in my chart to be kind of obsessed with liberation. <laughs> <laughs> and every longing that we have is really the same longing to know the truth of what we are and the truth of love. And I believe that everybody can fuel that and everybody can accelerate that through a true longing and a true curiosity. It might just be from a place of questioning, like, what is the truth? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and what, um, why do you think it's not really talked about? And, like, how was it for you going through it? I mean, I imagine it felt pretty isolating. It's not something a lot of people go through, mm -hmm. at least in, in our community, even a very spiritual community. I hadn't heard it talked about very much. Hmm. I think that it, I think it's a bit stigmatized. It's either stigmatized or fetishized mm -hmm. uh, as this like really magical thing that might not be quote unquote real um, because it's an experience that I think you need to have a, some sense of sensitivity to. Um, because people might be having kundalini energetics 
you know, moving through them, but they might not be so physically sensitive to it. And there's not a lot of education about it. And they are very confused with mental health issues. So for me, working with people in individual therapy, suffering from schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, just really all kinds of psychotic illnesses, uh, I personally believe that they were having kundalini experience, some of them having kundalini experiences that got um, frozen. Mm. And that much energy in the body fragments the consciousness and it's the it's a survival mechanism of the body and the mind to manage that much circuitry and there's a big trauma connection there um so yeah i think it can be stigmatized i've talked to a lot of people who had kundalini awakenings and ended up in the hospital medicated um, because nobody understood what was going on and the truth is that when these things happen to people in other countries, they're supported and they are, I don't want to say sheltered, but trained and protected um, as oracles, really, and are just embodiments, you know, of a god goddess. And yeah, there's really no context for that in our culture. And there's very few clinics, I think, around the world who actually support people in a really good way through a Kundalini awakening. Yeah. It's rare. Yeah, and and so what did help you? Because I know there were some really scary moments, and like, there might be people listening to this who are going through it right now. And what really grounded you, or helped you, or made you feel sane, or any mm. of that? Uh, yeah, talking about it, getting really, really vulnerable. I think there's maybe only three, four, or five people who I told what was really happening. Uh including a therapist. So I got, you know, professional support from someone I really trusted and, um, yeah, just really willing to go there and really willing to tell people what was happening and being reflected. I think I got reflected by a mentor of mine, how natural the mind's processes are of composting information. Like, okay, this is coming up to be purified. This is not who you are. This is not permanent. This is a gift, (laughs) which it did turn out to be in the Mm. end. Uh, But deeply nourishing myself, taking supplements, um, some isolation of like just being with people I feel safe with. Mm. Laying face down in the earth was really my favorite tool so simple you know it's like eating root vegetables getting a lot of sleep like there's really not much you can do to be honest like you can ask you can ask kundalini to slow down and take care of you and she'll respond i found that to be really supportive my one of my teachers swami satyananda saraswati who gave me shaktipat in the beginning when this was happening i think it was a big part of why it opened was my intention to receive the transmission from a guru i went to him and told him i was having a hard time and all he said was try to enjoy it (laughs) try to enjoy it (laughs) and i said but wait i went to the hospital i thought my heart was gonna and he goes open (laughs) (laughs) um and i did learn to enjoy it I did learn to ride the wave. It's like Kuan Yin riding a dragon in the storm, you know, with like grace and poise over yeah. time. Um, and just like a deep sense of trust and a connection with my womb that I didn't have. I, rem- I, I literally thought I was going insane. Like actually, truly, that's what I thought was happening. Um, and given my clinical training, I was like, oh yeah, here's X, Y, Z, would definitely be diagnosed with a brief psychotic disorder right now. Yeah. Um, But also having some background in yoga and spirituality, I was able to have some context for what was happening. And yeah, I, I really needed help. And my mentor was like, well, hey, let's pick one part of your body that you can just totally trust right now. And it was so clearly my womb that understood purification and understood death and understood destruction way more than my mind could or the rest of my body could. And so 
communing really deeply with my womb was such a big part of being able to get through it and having an experience of trusting the intelligence of my body and trusting the composting capacity of my womb, of my heart, and of my mind. Mm. Mm -hmm. And what gems and wisdom are you taking from it? And I know it was about a year or so that this is going on, on and off. I'm curious if it's still happening or if you mm. feel like you're on the other side. But like, what wisdom are you taking from it? Mm. Yeah, there's definitely been a leveling out of the intense symptoms. And I think the wisdom that I am taking from it is how powerful we are how loved we are, how safe we are to surrender to creation. If I could get through that, I think anybody could. Um, and yeah, just a deep reverence for this human journey mm -hmm. and a deep reverence for the goddess and a deep reverence for the power of prayer. <laughs> <laughs> I remember I was sitting in the yurt one day and I was eating pancakes and just the prayer was repeating like that I wanted to be pierced by love and I just was like yeah may these pancakes like pierce my soul like I couldn't I couldn't help it and like you ask for it and it comes wow. so yeah a reverence for the power of prayer <laughs> and our longing and our desire um Yeah, the goddess is really listening to us and mm. interacting with us and dancing with us. And yeah, there's a deep trust in myself now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And is there a feeling of like your consciousness of having evolved going through that? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I think I think I have less fear and and more resilience, like a, a really powerful resilience of seeing what I'm capable of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And soon after you decided to take a vow of celibacy and sobriety mm -hmm. for a year, mm -hmm. and you're just coming out of that, mm -hmm. <laughs> can you tell us what that was like and why you decided to do that? Yeah. It was amazing. <laughs> I had periods of intense challenge. Uh, so glad that I did it. It it was inspired after a somewhat traumatic uh, intimate experience in Bali, which really deeply exacerbated my kundalini symptoms. Um, and it became very clear that I needed to harness... Uh, the experience that I was having and protect it as precious. And through my relationship with Mary Magdalene, it felt really clear that I was being invited into relationship with the energy that I had awoken uh, and to come into just alignment and respect for it and to be its student. And I felt that I needed to commune with that in the most healthy way. I was looking for just health with the experience and realizing, oh yeah, having intimate connections is not supportive. I mean, supportive in a way that it led me to the celibacy um, and just really saw, yeah, that I had a lot of work to do. <laughs> uh, and then sobriety is a part of it that was yeah influenced by that realization that my body wasn't prepared to just add any more intense energy um, mm -hmm. or stirring up the pot it was already all the way stirred my subconscious mm -hmm. was it felt wide open uh with the dreams and the visions and the thoughts i was having it was like wow okay yeah it's all here to work with i don't need any more catalysts mm -hmm. <laughs> um so it was a beautiful year and I'm so grateful that I did it and would recommend it to anyone, truly. <laughs> hmm. um, I imagine there's a deeper trust in yourself 
Because I think some people taking a vow, it can feel like, can I really do this? Can I really hold my boundaries? Mm. Um, yeah, so I would just imagine having done it. Feel, you feel really proud. <laughs> you know, I didn't do it alone. Really? It's like I did do yeah. it alone, but I had Mary Magdalene and Yeshua as my guides through it. Mm. And six months into the vow, you and I and Luna Love held a ceremony with women to speak their vows into the roses and I shared the vow in front of all those women in a way of renewal and having that community and that support and I really needed it in the next six months like the second half of the year and then it was so beautiful Luna Love and I um, did another Magdalene immersion really like right at the end of the year of celibacy where we repeated <laughs> we repeated the ceremony um so having ceremony having sisterhood support and like really relying on the power of my guides yeah uh, to hold me in that and guide me through it and i'm yeah so grateful for the support that i received yeah and what really led me to do it was to see that I didn't have a very healthy relationship with my masculine side. Um, mm. I think through childhood trauma, it just wasn't really available to me. Uh, and I was ready to, to look at that and to observe how that communion with myself would affect my connections with the masculine outside of me. And realizing that the things I was looking for in other men was really that I was just looking for Yeshua. Mm. I was just looking to be in communion with the divine masculine Christ. And I have so many injuries on the right side of my body and was really ready to invite that presence into my own being. And it was so wonderful to take that year to commune with him uh, in a way that was really intentional and yeah. I can't quite share the the experiences I had with him because they're so precious but he gave me the gift the biggest gift at the end of a year like to the day like just prayed at night for him to show me or commune I pray every night for him to commune with me like please come back to me you know I've had these amazing moments with him and he really honored me yeah and it's it's really my inner Christ that's honoring yeah. me you know my inner divine masculine that is returning to me um what, ha what happened what happened <laughs> <laughs> yeah I um through the journey of like when when things were hard and then when things were pleasurable I was there were a few times when I heard his voice inside of me mm. um, one time in particular in the very beginning of this where I was shaking and crying in my bed um, and I just heard his voice and, and he said like speaking from within my chest and he said do not be afraid my child mm. and that really kept me going um remembering the sound of his voice and the feeling that came over me and yeah at the end I went to sleep and just was like wow I did this I did this for a year and I'd love to commune with you and um receive more of you and in the middle of the night I woke up to such a loud sound booming inside of me like as if you start um, a stereo and you don't realize that the music is on so loud it startled me and sat me up out of bed and it was just a male celestial song like mm. moving through my whole body um, and I felt so loved and so like anointed and so honored um, by by his energy within and without Mm. Um, this is recently? This just happened last week. Oh. I mean, like, when, whenever this ended, yeah, just this month or, yeah, a few weeks oh, wow. ago. Yeah. <laughs> it's worth celebrating. Yeah. It's so beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> um, so tell us just a little bit more about your relationship to Mary Magdalene and 
Jesus or Yeshua. Mm-hmm. There might be some people listening or who have, the only context they have for them is Christianity. So I wonder if you want to share anything about them and mm. your relationship to them. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I felt deeply connected to Yeshua before Mary Magdalene. She came a bit later. Uh, and I was raised, wasn't raised in a specific religion. My my mom's side of the family was quite um, interested in like paganism and Wicca and moon mysteries and things like that. And then at my dad's side, I went to some youth groups and things like that. But yeah, never really had a relationship with Yeshua. And just kind of hit me one day on the beach like I don't know what happened I just began crying like some kind of realization washed over me that the teachings that were being shared of him were not true and not his love and not his his expression uh, and I at the time I was reading a book called Living Buddha Living Christ by Thich Nhat Hanh and so that was kind of the catalyst and uh yeah, had a beautiful, beautiful communion with him in a lucid dream in what seemed to be the womb of the Divine Mother where there were trapped souls all around us uh, and I had a beautiful conversation with him about my intention to know him again uh, and he received his blessing and... Um, Yeah, so Yeshua is a human who walked the earth, and he's also an energy that lives inside all things. And the masculine Christ as not necessarily, as not the only Christ. You know, we think he's the only Christ, he's this thing to worship, um, and he's not. (laughs) Um, I actually was doing a puja to Jesus, me and my friend Sadat Mananda, we created 108 names of Jesus and I was doing puja to him which is basically just an adapted Shiva puja as taught by Srima and Swami Satyananda Saraswati and I was doing this puja and all of a sudden something felt as if it dropped out of the sky and bonked me on the head (laughs) like I literally stopped and was like looking around and was like what just happened like looking for a marble or something to, (laughs) to be next to me and there was nothing and I just got over the shock of it and closed my eyes and just deeply heard him saying you can worship me all you want but you also have to worship yourself because we are one and the same oh. Oh. <laughs> uh, so I, yeah I couldn't do the puja anymore after that <laughs> he was like yeah you're gonna have to put honey milk and yogurt and ghee all over yourself too <laughs> Um, Were you doing it to your Jesus statue? uh, It was actually the altar you and I created uh, in the living room. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. (laughs) Um, Yeah, what would you like to know? I feel I could talk for a long time about about Yeshua and Mary Magdalene. Yeah. Um, Well, maybe you could speak to Mary Magdalene now and just how you see her how she has helped you Mm. yeah yeah Hmm. I see Mary Magdalene as Shakti as the joy and bliss of the feminine as a mirror for all of life to be returned to its original innocence. It's a big theme, I think, for for her being willing to walk the path that she walked, knowing before incarnating that she would be shamed for thousands of years and being willing to do it anyway. And I see all, all beings as the Magdalene and how I work with her uh, in my devotion to Jesus, to Yeshua, as a Magdalene, 
Uh, and Magdalene is actually not just one woman. There's the Order of Magdalena, which is many people who served the mission of seeding Christ consciousness on the planet. And so I see myself as a Magdalene. I see you as a Magdalene. And anybody that wants to be a Magdalene is welcome to be a Magdalene. (laughs) Uh, Meaning the tower or the home of God. Mm -hmm. And yeah, Kaya Ra talks a lot about her not, or any of the masters not wanting to be worshipped in antiquity antiquated ways but to be our beloved friends and our beloved reflections and mirrors and I believe that she's waking up in so many women um, for leadership and for reconciliation with our sexuality being vehicles yeah for awakening mm-hmm. um, yeah She's the beloved. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And when I work with Yeshua, you know, doing eye gazing or puja or prayer, in that polarity of him being the masculine Christ, I become polarized as the feminine Christ. Mm -hmm. And I believe the feminine Christ is all of form. Um, Everything that is manifested being holy and pure and good and innocent and, and beautiful. And Magdalene is the bride of Christ, whether or not they were actually married or not. And she's pretty much erased from Christianity and Catholicism when she was really the one at the foot of the cross, like receiving his blood um, and really witnessing him when many of the disciples weren't able to be there. They just couldn't hold that much energy. Um, And Kaira teaches that Magdalene is an oracle for Kali, And I read a book called Tantric Jesus where this one priest who didn't know anything about Kali had this vision of the crucifixion and instead of Yeshua on the cross, it was Kali dancing. Mm. All the earthquakes and the lightning and all the energy was was moving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I'm on a journey of sharing that our physical bodies um, are the Magdalene the Holy Grail, um, the Bride of Christ. So in the traditions of Christianity and Catholicism, they say that the church is the Bride of Christ and you can only worship and receive Christ Mm -hmm. through the church. But the truth is that our bodies are the church and we are the Brides of Christ and everything that is living and in form um, is of like wanting to be available to be penetrated by Christ consciousness. (laughs) Oh my God, I just got chills. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I believe that that's what Kundalini awakening is. It's the penetration, you know, of of that um, into our bodies. And when that happens, a lot is needing to be purified and composted. And, and really, I think a lot of people out there and hopefully a lot of women listening are, are a yes to that. Mm-hmm. You know, being that vessel and being the bride the bride of Christ um, through communion with yeah, the body and being willing to be the embodiment mm-hmm. of the inner marriage. Mm-hmm. I personally like long every day for this something that I feel like I'm missing, um, which is like Sangha or community around walking that path asa- away from Christianity and Catholicism, but in some sort of newer form or old form um it's a really deep Mm. prayer for me so open to connecting with other women about it who are yeah on that same journey or curious about that journey Mm. can you share about just your own journey of leadership and particularly this past year um any fears that you've faced or vulnerabilities or taking up more space or sharing about this and Mm. what that journey has been like for you yeah (laughs) um well yeah I still get really nervous every time I teach and every time I hold circles and um there's often a process of yeah just fear and uncertainty and doubt that comes up every time and 
I realized that that's actually just because I care so much. I um, mm-hmm. want to honor the teachings in the best way. And I think that came up a lot recently in my immersion with Luna Love and um, the Magdalene Immersion ex- Exalt that we taught together of just being like, wow, can I really be a voice for Magdalene um, and Yeshua? And humbling myself to the fact that it's it's so much bigger than my own fears, it's so much bigger than my story, it's so much bigger than what I receive from it. Um, and realizing that it's a responsibility to share what we've remembered. A responsibility and an honor and a privilege because there's a lot of women out there who might be ready to be in a leadership role and they can't for whatever reason. Circumstances, uh, finances, just the country they live in. And so, yeah, it's it's a great responsibility. And the word privilege, yeah, just comes up really big for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's very courageous. Mm. you know it's scary to talk about these things sometimes it's getting better for me Mm -hmm. but the consciousness of the planet and the story that we have around christ is so threatening to people yeah people are still murdered over their love for christ in whatever way that manifests the way they share it and so i am grateful for all the support that i have and and want to share, you know, to anyone listening that you deserve, like, to get support with the fears that you have. Mm-hmm. Because we need your voice. Yeah. Deeply need these new prophecies coming through our bodies. And the visions that we have, I mean, all religions are based on and birthed from visionary experiences and direct revelations that come through the body. And we're no different. Um, Swamiji, who I was talking about when I was sitting with him in India, he said, you know, we're doing these pujas and we are the rishis that these scriptures were written for, to read and to practice with and to let them change us and then let us create new prophecy. You know, the the scriptures are living transmissions. They're changing. The teachings are ready to be changed. Mm -hmm. And we are the change that we're waiting for. So if I want this life path of um, communion with Yeshua and Magdalene and other masters within myself, it's like I have to create the world I want to live in. I can't wait for anybody else to give me permission. Like there's no one's going to write me a permission slip. No one's given me a passport to the place where I want to go. Like I have to create it and I have to go for it. Take action. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. I love witnessing it and you coming more and more into yourself and your truth and your alignment. Yeah. Thanks, Verita. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's great to be on this path with you. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have anything coming up in your work and in your business that you're excited about? Mm. Mm. I'm really excited about the one on word the one on one work I'm doing with women. It's always so exciting for me and fun and such an honor. I believe that we'll be doing more Magdalene immersions, uh, maybe in New York and then in Glastonbury. Those are kind of dream seeds that are coming forward to be birthed and I do have a series that I'm currently writing on um, this journey that I've been on in celibacy and my relationship with desire um, and innocence that I've been sharing in my email list so that's something that if anyone wants to read they can reach out to me I can send it to them Mm -hmm. Um, yeah and I'm just I'm excited about all all the things that are happening in the the community of instagram and people sharing and there's just a lot of magic happening and would love to connect with anyone listening and um share some of my resources with them and exchange yes 
We'll include your Instagram and your website in the show notes. Mm -hmm. Um, Do you have any closing words for us before we end this with a short prayer? Mm. (sighs) My closing words is just thank you. Thank you to everyone who's listening for your openness and the part of you that feels receptive to your yourself. The part of you that is willing to be courageous and willing to shed away all the things that you never were so that you can become all the things that you always were. And thank you for walking with me. Thank you for being here with me. We don't have to do this alone. Yeah, so let's all just breathe that in. <laughs> I'm just feeling the gratitude for this time, for this wisdom, for everything that came through. May it be of service to you, to all of you listening on your path, walking with devotion, with love in your heart. Oh, so much gratitude to Karen for being here, sharing her her stories, her wisdom with us. I bow, bow to Karen, bow to all of you, showing up, doing your work, being present, being here with us. I bow. Namaste. Mm, namaste. Thank you. Thanks so much for taking the time to listen to our show today. We would love to hear what you think. Take a moment to hop on over to iTunes and leave us a review. We'd be so grateful to receive it. Until next time, namaste.